Good day, viewers. Welcome to 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. My guest today is Alhaji Muhammad Mustafa bin Tube, former MD of Jaiz Bank and also a veteran of the banking industry. He is currently heading a capital venture company called Burak. Alhaji Mustafa, welcome to this program. Thank you very much, Manir. It's a pleasure and privilege. Tell me, um, what sort of education prepared you for this long three decades of, I mean, experience in the financial industry? Thank you very much. Um, both formal on the job uh, and self-development. Uh, in terms of formal, I was privileged to go, even in those days, um, public schools. The best school um, in my degree is Yerwa Central Primary School. Um, then I went to the Northeast College. I went to Yerwa Secondary School. Uh, ABU, of course, in those That's days. Amadou Bele Amadou Bele University, University among the best. Uh, in terms of career, also, I was lucky and privileged to start with the NNDC, the New Nigeria Development Company. That's like the breeding place for technocrats. And I'm glad and privileged that it really prepared us. Uh, the founding fathers had a very good vision, and that propelled us. So when we um, catapulted and left that institution to go uh, to the national level uh, in Lagos, we were able to hold our own. So we, even as young as uh, when I was below 30, I started attending board of directors meeting with uh, very high corporate gurus, uh, et cetera. So you get on the job uh, training. How easy was it to like adapt to Lagos life? I mean, here is a very cloistered northerner yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, with all the northern conservative values, and then you are just sprung on very cosmopolitan Lagos. Um, that's why I give credit to our elders and uh, former leaders uh, that set up the national uh, youth service program. Um, I did my service in the southwest, started in Ibadan. Probably your first contact with Correct. Absolutely. outside northern Absolutely. Nigeria. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That was the first time I crossed the Niger Bridge. I went to Ibadan, uh, University of Ibadan, and then from there I came to Lagos to complete uh, because even at that time I was interested in the financial institution. Right. So I went to NIDB, Nigerian Industrial Development Bank, I started my service with them, and as would a faithful habit, um, nearly 40 years after that, I am back uh, on the board of directors of Bank of Industry uh, at, the, at the apex level. So I started at the lowest rank, and then came back after about 40 years uh, as a director uh, uh, at the board level. These uh, days you seem to be a player more at the board level. You are uh, the chief executive, the first chief executive in Jaiz Bank. You are now on the uh, Bank of Industry. Yeah. And I think you are at the Communications Commission correct, as well, correct. NCC. Correct. Nigeria Reinsurance Corporation, uh, Gold Link, where I was a chairman. Um, now, even now I'm also the chairman of a trustee company based in Lagos. I'm also chairman of a reality company called Niels Realty, um, and so on and so forth. And also the chairman and CEO of Bra Capital, the company where I'm the major shareholder. shareholder. That is a uh, Islamic finance and investment company, capital market company under the regulation of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, At what point did you realize the potential of Islamic uh, financial instruments? I mean, someone who has worked in the normal financial institutions yeah. from FSB yeah. and others. At what point did you, uh, I mean, come to that switch? Again, it went back to my days in NNDC, New Nigeria Development Company. I was nominated or, to go and represent my boss in Lagos, 1987, um, for a conference on Islamic finance uh, organized by the Islamic Development Bank and some of our elders in the Nigerian financial system. And um, so I participated in that conference and I started developing interest. So when I came back to NNDC, I said, look, um, the moment I finish or honing myself, getting the necessary experience, I will move to the conventional banks, the big banks, um, because 
um, if you don't know how to do the conventional banking, you go to the Islamic banking, you will find it difficult to, to operate. So you first started with the conventional banks, like yes. where and where? I started with Credit Lyonnais. It's a French bank based in Lagos, uh, majority owned by the French. Um, again, I thank God. Um, I was on the board of directors uh, of Nidogas company with the f uh, late uh, Alison Aida, uh, one of the right, one of the so-called super, super permanent secretaries in right. Nigeria. Right. Yes, I was on the board of uh, Nidogas with him. I was representing NNDC. He was representing his own investment company. And that was how we got to know each other. And um, when I was about leaving um, uh, Kaduna, like I said, NNDC, right. I wanted to have, um, and he said, I'm most welcome in his bank. He was the chairman. And um, he spoke to the French to, uh, to make sure that they, they gave me. So since I went, that was my first time of getting exposure to global best practices. Right. I worked with the French. Uh, they sent me on training to Paris, London, Geneva. You know, so I saw it all uh, in terms of banking and finance and the global best practices. Is that, is that from where you now move to FSB? Correct. Right. Correct. Which had uh, Mohammed Hayatu Dean correct uh, as MD. Yeah, I remember he was our group managing director in NNDC, and right. he's one of our mentors. Uh, he was one of our leaders uh, that uh, invited us to NNDC, and um, thank God one was able to make his impact in NNDC. So when he had a new challenge of taking over a moribund bank, the former Federal Savings Bank, to transform it to a modern commercial bank uh, driven on IT, uh, strategic balance, etc. So he needed some of us that uh, he knows that we can help. Right. So he invited us to, to go and work with him. And we thank God for the experience. But in um, spite of all the transformation in, in that bank, it's disappeared like many other banks into some of the bigger behemoths that we now have? Well, you know, institutions, uh, you build institutions, they grow, they mature, and then they... Uh, of course, that was a government-imposed um, industry consolidation. Um, the same French bank where I had global best practices, uh, Credit Lyonnais, was taken over by Credit Agricole. So, big bank, international, but yet it was taken over by another competitor. So that's what happened to us at FSB. We are one of the best bank, highly IT driven. We have one of the best human resources. So we are a very uh, good target for, for tech for acquisition. Yeah, correct. Right. What happened to the NNDC? I mean, you are speaking so glowingly about it, but these days it's more like disappeared. Yeah. What happened is the, like, the biggest investment institution of northern Nigeria yeah. with interest in various fields. You've just spoken of yes. needle gas yes. and yes. so many others. Yes. What happened to it that these days you just Again, don't it's hear the, of it? it is the same with the rise and fall of empires of institutions. Uh, change in the geopolitics, in the economy. Um, the state government started proliferation of their own state investment companies and started to pay less attention to, to NNDC. Um, therefore, the little capital that we needed uh, was not forthcoming. Uh, the normal support that we require was not forthcoming. But for me, I think NNDC has achieved its purpose in terms of human capital development whether in the industry, in the banking sector, in the agri sector, um, wherever you go, we have uh, alumni. Um, like I said, when we went, when I went to Lagos to join Credit Leone, we have uh, an NDC informal alumni. Uh, every month we we hold lunch meeting. Uh, this month we do in your own house. Uh, next in somebody somebody's house, and then next. Um, so and we come from all sectors. Most of us are in the financial sector. But we have those that are in industry, those that are in finance, those that are in aviation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So f to that extent, I think NNDC has achieved its purpose. But it's not like the living, vibrant organism that it once was when it had hotels like the, right. uh, I mean, Hamdala Hotel, the Ariwa Hotels and all of those, yes. and then in industries. And even lately there was a time that it won the right to explore for oil in yeah. some parts of Nigeria. Yes, what yes. has happened to that? Yes, um, again, it's still what I told you. Um, a lot of political interferences, uh, the quality of human capital and the working environment wasn't what it used to be. Um, 
And like I said, the st state governments were concentrating more on their state investment companies. And the, the few professionals, the few people that were keeping it going, uh, had to jump ship and parachute and go to better places. Um, you talked about oil and gas, telecoms. Yes, they had it, but it's not only having the lenses, but you need the technical skills, you need the project management, execution skills, etc., which were lacking. And um, I so hope... So not much has come out of all those opportunities? Well, it's not, it's not yet over. Um, I understand there is a committee trying to resuscitate it. Um, they have a new chairman uh, uh, who is doing his best to restore its lost glory. But are any, I mean, is there any of the northern states that broke out of the Northern Nigerian Development Company that has a very vibrant investment arm that is making webs now? Um, even at that time, KSIP, Kano State Investment Properties, uh, stands out. Kaduna Investment was not doing bad. Um, uh, I saw the, that recently Kaduna State has a 29-year-old as the chief executive <laughs> of the <laughs> investment, which means maybe they are understanding the correct, need to correct. put a lot of energy correct. into it. Correct. correct. But is it just appointments or are there other ingredients that are necessary for this kind of ventures to succeed? Yeah. Well, you see, the era of development banking in Nigeria, I think the whole thing needs to be looked at again in view of the changes in the economy, in the finance. Um, now we are talking about ICT, FinTech, uh, we are talking about creative industry. Um, so unless uh, you, you have a management that is agile, that have the vision, um, and that have the commitment and the energy uh, to look into these sectors, um, they will continue to lag behind. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll go on a short break now, and then when we return, we'll continue with the conversation. Viewers, we'll now go on a short break in our discussion with Alaji Mohammed Bintube, the first MD of Jaiz Bank and a veteran of the Nigerian financial industry. Welcome back to 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. With me today is Alhaji Mustafa Alhaji Mohammed Mustafa bin Tube, the former MD of Jaiz Bank and a veteran of the Nigerian finance industry. Uh, Alhaji Mohammed Mustafa, you are Alhaji. talking about that now is the era of fintechs, creative industry, and what have you. Yeah. But it doesn't appear that in the north there is that appreciation by capital mm. of let's say, Carnewood and mm. all the creative mm. things that are happening. I think more of what you hear is all the moral <laughs> announcement about the right or wrong of yeah. what they are doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think you have to look at it holistically. Um, the level, quality of education, the depth has unfortunately deteriorated uh, in this part of the country. Um, so we need to look at the how to rejuvenate, rejuvenate education um, so that make it functional. Uh, we have people that go through the university, but they don't allow the, the university to go through them. Yes. They have certificates, but you know they don't know what is in the certificate. Um, so, and if you don't have that, then the ways of doing things, the modern ways of things, will continue to uh, to elude you. Uh, you will not compete. Um, the system is not producing global citizens. Uh, the system is not producing uh, people that are enabled by ICT, by sound education, uh, looking at a global view, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I told you about. Uh, you spoke about fintech. Um, I think. Uh, inflow foreign direct investment, especially in the venture capital and ICT, to Africa was about $5 billion in 2021. $5 billion? $5 billion in fintech venture capital. And about $2.5 billion of that uh, came to Nigeria. And um, half of that roughly? Yes. Okay. 
uh, <clears throat> and who are the beneficiaries? Uh, Flutter Wave, Kunda, you know, all these. Uh, a lot of the Lagos based. Correct. Uh, correct. Is it because there are no, I mean, technical help, the kind of help that you have in Yaba and other parts of uh, Lagos and the south? Yeah. Is that the reason why you don't have this uh, financial technical technology companies coming up? Yeah, you see, the, like I said, unless education is supposed to bring an all-rounded individual. Yes. Um, so unless the educational system in those days, um, you have the craft schools, you have the polytechnics, um, you have even uh, ABU, um, University of Medjugorje, Bayern University, Kano, um, they produce very, very good uh, uh, outputs, uh, graduates, and, and they can compete anywhere, including globally. Um, so what I'm saying is this quality has gone down. Um, on the other side of the, of the river Niger, um, people, uh, market women, um, artisans, they save and send their children to the best schools. Um, so, and then because of population explosion, uh, the facilities that our children, you and I enjoyed in those days in public schools are no longer there. Um, so we are not competitive. Um, and therefore, uh, if you go and make a bid or if you go and make a pitch to venture capitalists, etc., cetera, um, you find that um, there are a lot of gaps that needs to be done. But in terms of natural intelligence, in terms of uh, the need to achieve, um, our youngsters are doing well, but the enabling environment the can-do attitude, the facilities. Uh, this is what is uh, the flutter wave that I told you about. Um, was able to go and raise about 100 or 20 million or so dollars. Today, its valuation is about three billion dollars. You understand? And there must be few so, Nigerian yeah, companies, exactly, yeah, even some state governments. Exactly their balance sheet. That, I don't think. Yes. So, um, fintech. Uh, that is where it is. Most of the most of the transactions are now based on fintech, based yes. on, you know, the central bank by deliberate policy is now reducing um, cash economy. That's why you have the ATMs, that's why you have the uh, mobile banking, uh, you understand, the internet banking. Uh, but a lot of youngsters are interested in cryptocurrencies. Yes. And uh, it appears the Nigerian authorities are slowing things down on that. Uh, it's not only the Nigerian authorities, um, even the big, uh, uh, what do you call, Facebook wanted to do their own, what do you call, DeFi, um, and they had some regulatory issues. Uh, Alibaba in China uh, wanted to do, uh, go bigger than what it is, but there are some regulatory issues. Uh, having said that, uh, cryptocurrencies, um, the cryptocracy, etc., uh, is, is it is an idea that this time has come. Uh, the regulators can only delay it, uh, but they have to, and they have started to embrace it, including the U.S. Federal Reserves, the U.K. financial uh, regulatory authorities. They are just trying to see how to accommodate them and how to coexist and create the necessary regulatory framework. Um, but, but but all this is at a time when. In our part of Nigeria, people are even still skeptical about banking, about yeah. interest, and what have you, which was why you, I mean, banks like Jais came in, and then now we have Lotus, we have uh, Taj Bank, yes. and I hear there are even more on the way. Correct. Um, Correct. How do you address that when there is this concern mm. about interest, usury, yeah. and what have you, yeah. while other people are already going to space, so to yeah. say, <laughs> in terms of finance by yeah. Yeah. embracing cryptocurrencies. Yeah, yeah. Um, you started on the right note. Um, ethical issues are very important. Whether you are in Nigeria, South Africa, US, there are ethical people with ethical um, concerns. concerns. And um, so one of the things that was against financial inclusion in the north, northern Nigeria, in this part of the country, is this issue about usury. Uh, but even in the southern Nigeria, there are 
a lot of people that have concerns about ethical banking. Um, in those days, some of the banks have what they call ethical funds because they, they, they found that even in that part of the country, there are people that they don't want their investment to go into breweries, tobaccos, so that's why they call it, I don't want to call the name of the bank because I don't want to promote one bank against yes. the other. But, so they have ethical funds. So this is now what we try to do by setting up Jai's Bank, to bring banking services to our people uh, in line with their ethical beliefs and their, own, their religious beliefs. And I'm glad, uh, like you just pointed out, it's now beginning to catch up. We have Jai's Bank, which just celebrated its, celebrated its 10th year and is growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, then Lotus Capital, Lotus Bank came in. Um, then we have Touch Bank. Um, and then right now, uh, my company, Brack Capital, we are now about starting uh, another fresh Islamic bank. Some people came and approached us. They said, look, you have done Jai's, you have done Touch. Um, so why don't you help us uh, do that? That's so more are coming. More are coming. But more importantly, I think what gave the impetus to Islamic finance in Nigeria, not only in this part of the country, is the bold decision by the federal government uh, to go into, because they saw the benefits of Islamic finance, because it's focused on the real sector of the economy, um, to start what we call sukuk. That's the, like the equivalent of the conventional bonds. And these are based on uh, real assets, and this ring fenced is on ethical investment. Uh, so, federal government came out in 2017 to first def the debut uh, sukuk with a hundred million, uh, 100 billion, billion. offer. Uh, it was oversubscribed. We got about uh, 120 or so. Then, 2018, it came with about 150, and then it was oversubscribed. Uh, then 2019, it came um, with, uh, I've forgotten the exact amount, but it was oversubscribed by nearly 300, 400%. So it's a very... Um, yeah, and then with the recent one, Skook 4, we came out to raise, the federal government came out, we, in all this, with all sense of humility, my company, Brack Capital, was involved in Skook 1, FGN Skook 1, Skook 2, Skook 3, Skook 4. And uh, God willing, we'll also be involved in Skook 5. So, but what I'm saying is, this has now brought banking closer to our people. It is now trying to reduce the level of financial exclusion, uh, especially in this part of the country. But financial exclusion is a very serious drawback, um, not only in this part of the country, but particularly in the Northwest. Uh, about 70, 69% are financially excluded. The same thing in the North is about 69%. In the Southwest, 30%. In the South South, 40% are financially excluded. So you see that we need a lot to do to catch up. Uh, Islamic finance is one of them. Uh, but like I said, level of education is another one. And also our uh, competitive advantage, agriculture. We need to change the way we do agriculture. You understand? Um, and then mining uh, sectors. If we can, you know, focus on this and revive this, um, there will be more opportunities and people will begin to embrace uh, financial inclusion, not only Islamic bank, but fintech and others. But some of the customers of the Islamic bank say they don't see the clear difference because if it is about the rates charged, whether you call it administrative or some other name, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. almost the same as in the other conventional Bank, so they wonder what is it, and then also yeah. in terms of the fintech you are talking about, yeah, yeah. the their systems are not as robust. Yeah. A lot of times they are downtime. So why is it so? Well, uh, don't there are some people who are making statements about things they don't understand. Um, if you are a scholar, I think you should focus on your scholarly something, but. The main difference is with Islamic finance in the conventional system. Uh, if you apply, I told you we are, we are packaging one to go to the central bank. Yes. If you don't have Sharia advisory board, the central bank will not give you an Islamic banking license. Uh, that's number one. That is a board that will advise exactly. you whether what you are doing yeah, is yeah. strictly yeah. in consonance yeah. with the rules of Islam or not. Yeah. And these rules of Islam are simple. It's about objectivity, fairness, Transparency, uh, I hope you understand. Uh, this cook I'm telling you is not only people from this, but all over the 
um, people from Northwest, East, South, John, Mohammed, Kemi, everybody invested in the retail sector. And <clears throat> we had to go to FRAS, Financial Regulatory Authority Committee of Experts. We had about over 10 legal documents that has to go through to see that this is really compliant with Sharia and it complies with the ethical standards that were both the Christians and, and the Muslims that require. Uh, you have, um, what do you call it? You have the, uh, the deed uh, or deed of trustees, you have the vending agreement, you have the Ijara agreement, mm. you understand, and up to 12 of them. And each one of them, we have to go and defend before this uh, Sharia expert to make sure. I, so for somebody to tell you that it's the same, of course, um, it's the same person uh, who will go and buy uh, malt drink. Um, we, is he drinking beer? Because the production process is very, very similar, isn't it? It's only the alcoholic content. Yes. Isn't it? So is that why the charges are more or less the same? That's the rates and also in terms of access to finance, to getting loans for people to be more financially inclusive is still difficult. Yeah, if you go to the market, um, the market women are selling where some of them are similar, some of them are different, but they benchmark. They see what price is the other woman in the next stall, what is she selling her price. Um, because if you overprice, then you will, and if you underprice, then you will make a loss. So it's benchmarking. Um, that's why, why do they call LIBOR, uh, LIBOR London Interbank offer rate? That people benchmark uh, around that. Uh, I hope you understand. Yes. Um, so there are differences in the contract, uh, in the Sharia screening process, and even in the financing. Uh, um, Islamic banks don't finance alcohol, tobacco, anything that involves uh, uh, speculation. Uh, I hope you understand. So that you go and don't go and gamble with people's money. That's why the Sukuk is very, very successful. The federal ministry, the contractors want it, the federal ministry. So it used to be Sukuk 1, 2, 3, were all under federal ministry, um, federal ministry works. works. But this Sukuk 4, we have Niger Delta ministry. Uh, they brought in. Then FCT came in. It's about financing yeah, projects yeah, in yeah, all these areas. And, in and the because FCT, it is in the Niger working Delta. better than the other you know, the general, you know, form of financing they used to do. That's why people are embracing it. So in less than a minute, where do you see Islamic finance going in Nigeria in the next uh, two, three years? Well, uh, I said we are working on one. So the more players in the market, the more the regulators will take us serious, the more uh, awareness will, will come in. And then the embracing of fintech and technology by this, um, like you said, we are serving the same. I can go to GT Bank, um, and uh, I say I, I don't want to deal with interest. Just give me the platform for your service. They are very efficient in transfers, in international transactions. You understand. So if the Islamic banks don't provide the same level of service platform, then they will migrate. And mark you, uh, Sterling Bank. Has, is doing dual banking. They have the conventional and the Islamic. Yes. So if Jais and Taj, uh, Lotus, they don't sit up, their customers will migrate. And these big banks will begin to open more windows or even more standalone. Thank you very much, Alaji Mohammed Mustafa bin Tubi. Viewers, we've come to the end of this edition of 30 Minutes. Keep a date with us.